welcome back and we are talking today we're going to do something a bit different what we're going to do is introduce our 2021 season of videos because I think I told you a few months ago that we were going to explore Australian writing and that is what we're going to be doing in 2021. So before we explore Australian literature, I thought what I would do is give you a little bit of a background on why this is important if you are an Australian writer or really if you're any kind of writer, but especially if you're an Australian writer, which I think most of my viewers are. So we're talking about Australian literature and I know, I know, I just heard the collective groan from the entire audience of, oh no, not Australian stuff, there's nothing good there, it's boring, I don't want to read that. Yeah? Yeah, I heard you. I heard you. And so, that's what I want to address today. So that's a very, very common um, reaction when you talk about Australian literature. It's Australia doesn't have a literature. Australia is just blokes and bush and bogans in beer. Australia has no culture. Well, Australia does have a culture. And if you look beyond the little black box of the television set and you look beyond the really kitschy, nasty, snarly kind of gro embarrassing grossness that is tourist destination advertising, you do find a very, very different Australia. So for most people, their conception of white Australia is very, very, very stuck in the 60s or the 50s even. Very male working class, um, parochial, very closed-minded, racist, really a very unattractive picture. And I can understand why people, especially writers, would like to pull back from that to say, Ugh, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But this is part of the problem, is a lack of familiarity. You can't be what you can't see. And for myself, I found that the big problem was that as a urban Australian woman, I didn't find myself in the books that I had managed to lay my hands on, which is a problem in Australian publishing is our books go out of print very, very fast. They get a short print run often, especially if they're the literary genre. They get a short print run and then they disappear. So unless you're in the know and know what you're looking for and looking forward to the next such and such, you don't know these books are there. And this is, this is problematic if you are a, of the younger generation and you missed some of these writers because they just disappeared unless you knew exactly what to look for in a secondhand bookshop or had a particularly knowledgeable older friend with a massive library of Australian works finding these books was like finding hen's teeth they're just so hard to find um one of it, it they're also when I went through university I don't recall reading a single Australian writer and I don't recall my peers reading Australian writers either. So when things are not being taught, I was not taught a single Australian writer at school. So when these things are not in the cultural milieu, in the places of education, then it is very hard to, to sort of come up with, well, what is an Australian writer? What, what constitutes Australian writing? And this was a, an issue that an academic writing in text, Bridget Marginer, I hope I pronounced her correctly, I will put a link in below to find her essay, 
um, talked about when she talked about introducing Australian writing to young undergraduates is that they didn't like it. They had formed a prejudice against it, a, a variation on the cultural cringe. You know, that um, A.A. Phillips cultural cringe that if it's made in Australia, it must be bad as automatic prejudice, the thing that had every single journalist at stand in the 70s. You would see them when a celebrity came. They'd be all down at Mascot Airport, standing on the tarmac as soon as they got off the plane. What do you think of Australia? Well, it looks pretty good for a Mascot Airport. God knows. That, that really deep insecurity that anything we produce is not good enough. This is, so we sort of keep, it's a bit of a whack-a-mole. You're not, you're not one head off a snake and then another one comes up, another one, another one, another one. It's not the easiest thing to kill off. It's sort of, you watched Hatton last week? It's sort of like um, imposter syndrome on a national scale. Not the easiest thing to, um, to kill off, especially when, you're constantly comparing yourself to the grand imperialist literature of somewhere like America or England, which is very much overshadowing everything that we do because Australian writing is post-colonial writing and you'll learn more about post-colonial writing next year with Janice because she's going to explain some of that. But we're talking very specifically about Australian writing what we, the stories we tell each other and we tell about ourselves. One of the other things that um, the students that Marjana talked to were that was one of the other issues that they had was that Australia doesn't have a canon and we don't. We're very, very lucky in that we don't have a set of books. These are the books you must read. Because canon is really, really out of, out of date. It's, it's, it's a terrible idea, the idea that these are the books you have to read and they're very, generally canon is very white and very male and excludes a lot and, and very privileged male and it, it, it excludes a great many voices. So by not having a canon, Australia actually is liberated from having these big, imposing, scary figures. Okay, we have one really big, imposing, scary figure, and that's Patrick White, who we will talk about next year. But, the grand old man. But we don't have a canon. He, even he is not canon. You don't have to read him. Um, and so, but a lot of younger writers, a lot of very younger, I'm thinking millennials, millennials actually want a canon. I think it's partly to do with the way that they watch television shows and the way that they use fan fiction. It's like, this is canon and this is fan fiction. This is canon and this is side thing. Well, Australian literature doesn't have a canon. There is no official group of books. And as I said, that's liberating. But for some people, that's really, really scary. Because the idea is, if you don't have a canon, how do you know what's good? <sighs> And if you're not familiar with something, how do I know it's good? How do I know I'm not going to be tricked into reading something that's subpar? Well, in all honesty, that's kind of the risk of reading. I mean, I, I read, I read, I hate to say this. I hate to say this because I really love her. I read Jeanette Winterson's latest novel and it wasn't good. It just, I didn't like it. I didn't think she was on, on the ball great writer, one of my favourite writers, but there you go, even a great writer can have a bad day. And I've read through all of her stuff and that was the only one that I really thought, hmm, mm, yeah, just didn't, didn't work for me. was disappointed. Disappointment is just part of reading, it's part of life. You can't guarantee your way out of disappointment. So that's what I'd say to having a canon. Australian writing has a very specific tone. And, and when you read enough of it, now I'm doing this after engaging in a three year, I engaged in a solid three year of reading exclusively Australian writers. And one of the funny things is, is each state, not only the country, but each state has slight variation and slight tone that's different. 
So just as Australia has really only about three big accents, the really striny, bogany accent, the sort of middle brow accent, and then the educated accent, which is what I speak. Um, so you've got heart heavy, softer, and then educated, really. Those are the three accents in Australia. Um, you do get variation over in Western Australia. It can sound a lot chalkier, very hard to do. If you can pull off a chalky Western Australian accent, wow. Um, Queensland is really much more striny up in the north. Um, you get a lot more, you hear that a lot more, whereas mine is very much more educated and New South Wales. So just as we get a, this variation in accent, we also get a variation in tone of novel. So what it means is that when you read a book from New South Wales, there's a certain degree of, um, I'll get mine and good luck to you. I'm not going to actively oppose you, but you know, I'm not really that interested in you. I'm interested in me. So a bit of rapacious self-interest. You go down to Melbourne, and go down to Victoria. Victoria has always had a bit of a, you know, veneer of, of civility. Victorians like to think of themselves as New South Wales as posh younger siblings. So they're quite, they, they still have that rapacious self-interest, but they, they, they cover it over. They cover it over with that veneer of civility. It's a bit like Dame Edna Edridge, or more Mrs. Edridge of Mooney Ponds. So you've got that veneer of civility there. It's just as rapacious self-interest, but it's just a veneer, a veneer. You know, we're not quite as uncivilized as them up north. Um, I haven't read that many books from Queensland, but Queensland is a little bit more um, aggressive than New South Wales and Tasmania. Tasmania is a real, I've read a few books from Tasmania. And while New South Wales is, I've got mine and I'm not going to bother with you, New, Tasmania books have a real tone of tall poppy. They are not just going, not only are you going to, are we interested in it, have our own interests, we're going to actively pull you down to our level if you try to climb out. They are really, they have a really um, aggressive tone. They make wake in fright. <laughs> they make wake in fright look, look civilised. We'll talk about wake in fright in a couple of months. Um, Western Australia is very interesting because it actually, the, they're the closest that you would get to sort of an American style um, prosperity and expansion and capitalism you get very much in, in Western Australia. South Australia is, I hate to say this, South Australia, but you're too civilised for your own good. Sorry, but the books that I've read from South Australia are really too civilised for their own good. <laughs> and then, on top of this, that's just the tone of white Australia, white and migrant Australia. On top of this, we also have indigenous writers who I will talk about completely separately because they are speaking from a, a different culture, a different understanding. We share a language that we are writing in, but I will, when I talk about some of the indigenous writers, we will see how, how very, very different they are in their view of this country that we share. So that will be very interesting. There are, this is not a whitewashed Australia. This is I, what I would like to sh share with you is Australia in its fullest interest. So the reason we're doing Australian writing is because if you are writing in Australia, if you are telling Australian stories, it is so much easier to do it from a place of knowledge because you can't be what you can't see. And as a little girl growing up in this country, I didn't see women who had the 
goals that I had. I didn't see the university educated women. I knew it was possible, but I didn't see them. They weren't on my television set. What I was seeing was a very narrow scope. And when I found the books, and I didn't find the books t until I got into my early 30s, this was because the books came via text publishing. So almost all the books that we have a look at next year are going to be text publishing books. They reprinted in these beautiful yellow covers Australian books that had gone well and truly out of print that you just could not get a hold of. So they reprinted them. They're like Penguin classics. These are text classics. They're Australian, some are New Zealand, mostly Australian, and they talk in our voices. And when I read the first one, it was set in Sydney, and you would not believe how excited I was to read my own city. I'm not, I'm not from Sydney, I'm from the mountains, but it's, it's a city that I know, a city I go to, my city. Not Melbourne, not Brisbane, not Canberra, it was Sydney. And I had been on the Manly Ferry. I had, I had seen the Norfolk Pines at Manly. This was the city my grandfather built ships in during the Second World War. This was the city, this was the ferry that my granny went from Manly into the city to go to Secretarial College. This was a city I knew. I know exactly what those hot, steamy Sydney nights feel like. I've lived there. I've lived in um, Surrey Hills when I was quite young for a little while. And so I knew this city. I've walked the botanical gardens. I've done this. I've, this is my city. And it was so amazing having read books that were set in London or New York or Moscow. And, and having to imagine strange and unusual places. And, and imagine, oh, well, what kind of accent is that? I don't know. To suddenly, oh, all the characters talk like me. Wow. All these characters have an experience that I recognize was not cringy, but just, it was like coming home. Now, they weren't nice. <laughs> <laughs> These weren't nice people. These were not the, the genteel people of a, of a Jane Austen novel. These were Australians, so, and they were from New South Wales, so they weren't exactly the nicest of people. They had their rough edges. But that was actually amazing. You can be impolite. You can be Australian. You can be big. And it's not a problem. I mean... It was, it was a revelation. And I hope over the next year, as we work our way through Australian writers, you will find someone or a book who resonates with you and allows you to be the writer you should be, to tell the story you should tell about us and expand our cultural conversation. Because we're not a little version of America. We're not a little version of England. We're not a little version of anywhere. We are ourselves. And when we understand that we are ourselves, then we can move forward in a much, much more confident manner. We can leave that dreaded, dreaded cringe back in the past where it belongs. So. I'll see you later and we are going to start with that book that left such an impression on me or rather with the writer whose book left such an impression on me. We are going to start our journeys in Australian literature in I think January with Elizabeth Harawa. So get out to your library, get to your bookstore pick up some Elizabeth Harrow. She died only recently and was lucky enough to see the resurgence in interest in her work. Um, but 
we'll check her out. So I'll see you next time with Elizabeth Harrow. Bye.